Mul on hea meelde, et tervitada täna õhtulisin Eesti pangas ja siis juhtada seminar, kus me räägime mitte üksnes tavapärasest investeerimisest, mis on suunatud sellele, et investorite ainult rahalist lisatulu teenida, vaid millestki pisut võib öelda, et tavapäratumast ja nende kaugemale vaatamast. Ja võibolla ongi õige sellest rääkida eriti, kuna viimasel ajal vähemalt finanstuurgudel on nii raske olnud tulu teenida, et et ongi mõistlik otsida alternatiive. And I would also like to welcome Andres Björnsson from the Savings Bank Foundation DNB, who shared experiences from Norway. Täna on siis kõneal võimalus investeerida vanade meistrite valmistatud muusika instrumentidesse, mis on oma omadustelt kordumatud ja korvamatud. Olgu siis põhjuseks Kas erilised näiteks sajandide tagused kliimaolud, milles kasvanud puit andis pillil erilise kõlavärvingu või mõni muu nüants, miks ei ole võimalik sellised instrumente asendada ühegi uue pilliga. Aga samas ei ole sellise investeeringu eesmärk mõistagi lukustada määrtuslik instrument pangaseifi, pill peab elama ja kõlama. Ja sellise võimaluse annavadki mitmel pool maailmas asutatud pillifondid, mis viivad kokku investorid ja muusikud. Kalli hinnaline pill liigub fondi vahendusel edasi väärilisele interpreedile ja nii saame ka täna kuulda Hans-Kristjan Aavikut musitseerimas umbes 1610 aastast pärit viiulilt. Tunnistad, mullegi on silma jäänud pillifondi konsertite sari, sest ka Eestis on nüüd alates 2015. aastast tänu pillifondi, tänu tublidele eestvedajalat tule olemas pillifond, et teha väärtuslikud instrumentid ka siin mail siis kätte saadavaks. See kindlasti avardab Eesti muusikute võimalusi meistri pillidel uusi kõrgusi püüda, et publikut rõõmustada ja võibolla ka rahvusvaheliselt rohkem tähelepanu pälvida. Nii panustab Giga Investor fondi kaudu kindlasti ka Eesti muusikakultuuri arengusse. Mul on hea meel olla sellele seminarile võõrustajaks siin Eesti pangas, kus me suugugi tegelikult ei tegele vaid raha lugemise ja trükkimisega naljaga pooleks, vaid oleme samuti pannud õla alla ka kaunitele kunstidele. Juba esimese vabariigi ajal sai algus Eesti panga kunstikogu, et toetada eelkõige siis Eesti rahvuskultuuri säilimist ja arendamist, kuid nii nagu teise maailmasõjal aastas, teine maailmasõjal aastas Eesti muusikute keelpili kogu, nii läks kaduma ka enamus Eesti panga algsest kunstikogus sõjakeerises. Meil on tänaseks alles vaid paar üksikud tööd, aga Eesti pank on jätkanud ka siiski hiljem oma kunstikogu täiendamist. Ja need arvukad tööd ka meie puhul, need mitte me ei ole peitnud Eesti panga vara hoidlasse, vaid need kaunistavad siis Eesti panga Eesti panga kabinete ja koridore ja sellega siis lisavad värvi meie töötajate argipäeva. Seda liiki investeeringutes on rohkem emotsiooni kui traditsioonilisemalt laadi rahapaigutustes, kuid siinki mõistagi ei tohi unustada riske, põhjus. Vanadel pillidel ilmselt suuremad riskid on seotud võltsingute ja hävinemise ohuga ja ma usun, et ju tuleb sellest ka täna juttu, et kuidas pillifond need riskid on investorite jaoks maandanud ja tahaksin loota, et huvi sellist laadi investeerimus võimaluste vastu Eestis kasvab ning et uute investorite abiga pillifond saab soetada uusi instrumente ja luua avaramaid enesed joostuse võimalusi Eesti muusikutele. Ja Eesti investorid samal ajal saavad siis võimaluse oma investeeringute mitmekesistamiseks. Eesti vanarahvast tavatses väärtustada rikkust, mida ei söö koi ega rikku rooste. Vanade pillide puhul, ma ei tea, kas sõna sõnalt saab niimoodi öelda, aga siiski pillid on haprad ja vajavad ekstra hoolt. Ma usun, et saame olla kindlad, et pilli fond selle vajaliku hoole kallitele instrumentidele ka tagab. Ning kindlasti ei söö koi ega rikku rooste seda rõõmu ja naudingut mida võib pakkuda osava mängija käes helisev pill või teadmine, et oled väärtuslikku instrumenti soetada aidates mõnele noorele interpreedile tuult tiibadesse andnud. 
Aitäh ja soovin teile kõigile huvitavat seminari. Suur tänu Eesti Panga presidentile Madis Müllerile, kes avas pillifondi teema juba nii professionaalselt ja nii selgelt meile kõigile. Pillifond loodi 2015 lõpul kultuuriministeeriumi initsiatiivil. Asutajaliikmed on Sveetbank, Eesti Rahvuskultuurifond ja maestro Paavo Järvi. Ta loodi eelkõige Eesti keelpilli kultuuri arendamiseks, aga see pole ainult see. Me toome siia Eestisse praegu sajandite vanuseid pille. See tähendab praegu juba, et me toome siia Euroopa pärandit ja meie noored muusikud saavad samuti panustada Euroopa pärandi arengule. Mul tuleb praegu meelde Katariina Maria Kitse, meie noore viiuldaja, tähelepanek, kui ta sai endale Enrico Katenari pilli, mis on väga vana pill Itaaliast. Ja tutvudes selle pilli võimalustega ta ütles, mul on selline tunne, et seda sama teost on keegi selle pilli peal mänginud enne mind. Et see side on nii elav, see on nii emotsionaalne ja see on nii mõjus, et pillifondi tähendus ilmselt on märksa rohkem pillide näol kui lihtsalt Eesti keelpillikultuuri arendamine. Meil on praegu kümme pilli ja üheksa poognat. Selle fondi, pillifondi kolleksiooni maksumus on 1,7 miljonit. Ilma investoriteta, Eesti ärimeesteta, ütleks nii, ei oleks pillifondi. Nii et see seab kogu pillifondi tegemise hoopis teistesse rõõbastesse. Need inimesed, kes tahavad Eesti kõrgkultuuri toetada, Eesti klassikalist muusikat, need on olemas. Ja me loodame, et need tuleb järjest juurde. Pillifond loob selleks tingimused. Meil on pillid on kõik sertifitseeritud maailma parimate ekspertide poolt. Meil on kindlustus Londonis, loidi kindlustus. Meil on kohalik security turvafirma on meil G4S. Meil on advokatibüro Trinity, kes aitab meil lepinguid teha. Me oleme väga kaitstud igasuguste võimalike eksimuste eest. Me oleme teinud oma parima. Ja mis on veel oluline, et meie pillid on hooldatud, litsenseeritud meistrite poolt Soomes. See ei ole ainult kõik pillifondi tegevus. Pillifondil on väga hea partner EAS, kelle näol me ka praegu sellist seminare siin korraldame. Ka investorid vajavad koolitus, ka investorid vajavad teadmisi, mida tähendab üldse investeerida pillidesse. Samuti ei ole meil praegu ka päris pillimeistreid. Me oleme teinud ka pillimeistrite koolitusi mitmeid ja see on toimunud kõik EAS-i toel. Aitäh, EAS! Täna on mul ka suur rõõm siin esitleda Eesti praegust esiviiuldajat, kes on Hans Kristjan Aavik ja kes mängib meie fondi poolt restaureeritud pillil Madžini, ta räägib ise sellest pillist, see on kuulsa Eesti muusiku Boba Vladimir Saposnini pill, mis tänu pillifondile võin öelda, on ka nüüd ellu äratatud. Selle pilliga ta võitis esikoha üks mainekamatel konkursil, mis on Karl Nilsseni konkurs Kopenhaagenis. Sellist asja pole eriti varem juhtunud. Nii et ma praegu laseks kõlada muusikal, Kui on huvi detailide vastu, siis palun pöörduge ja me arutame seda teemat täpsemalt. Aitäh! Ja 
Marje palus mulle siia täna tulla. Veidi rääkida oma pillist ning ka paar, paar teost mängida. Ma mängin näit mõned katkendid mõnes teosest, aga ma mõtlesin, et need on ilusad valikud võibolla. Nimelt ma mängin, ja Giovanni Paolo Magini instrumentil, see on aastas 1000, umbes aastas 1610, mis on minu ajaks täiesti võimatu üldse mõelda, et nii pikalt midagi on säilinud. Aga tõesti see on nagu kunstiteos ja see võiks ju kuuluda muuseumisse, aga eeldatavasti pillidel oleks hea, kui nad saaksid kõlada. Ja see, et üldse Eestil on sellised pillid meile pakkuda, on väga eriline, ma ütleks. Et muidugi veel Eesti pillifond ei ole nii suureks kasvanud kui mõned teised fondid välismaal, aga see, et meil on juba selline algus olemas, on ma arvan väga oluline. Ning ja ma mängin teile väikse lõigu siis masnei meditatsioonist. Ja võibolla siis, et kui on veel mingid küsimusi, siis võib enne minu viimast lugu küsida. Mikrisse. Ja nimelt minul on selle pillikold juba võimalus mängida vist kas neli aastat ja mul on väga hea meel, et mul pikendati seda lepingut, sest see konkurs, kus ma just käisin, seal ma ka just selle pilliga mängisin ja sain rääkida nende jüri, jüriga, kes on tõesti kõik on maailma kuulsad tipsolistid ja Berliini filharmoonikute konsertmeister näiteks ütles, et see on, et kohe esimesest korrast, kui ta seda kuulis, ta teades, et see on üks väga erilise kõlaga pill, et see peab olema midagi rariteetselt. Näiteks esimene voor oli meil just sirmi taga, nii et ta isegi ei näinud seda. Ja see tõesti andis mulle ka kindlust, et see on, see on midagi erilist ning samuti tegelikult tega ainult pill ei mängi, et niimoodi ei, ei tule siit midagi välja, et, et samuti poogen on väga tähtis siis prantsuse poogen Viktor Fetik, kes on tõesti ka väga kuulus, kuulus meister ja ma arvan, et see kombo kuidagi annab ühe väga erilise, erilise kõla välja. Ma mõtsin, et see tuli mul just paar minutit tagasi, et ma lõpetan ikkagi millegi virtuoossega, et vaatame, kuidas mul see välja tuleb, ma ei jõudnud seda väga veel arituda. Aga nimelt Locatelli ühest kapriisist mängin ühe väikse lõigu. Ega küsimusi, kas oli küsimusi või, või pigem kuul, kuulame siis lihtsalt. Thank you. 
Nüüd siis ma palun siia ära Andes Pealtseni, kes on Norra Hoiupanga fondi, tekstra fondi juht. Alustame. Thank you so much, uh, Maya, and thank you, Pelifon, for the very warm welcome uh, you have given me here. It's a pleasure for me to be here um, and in this beautiful country. This is my first visit. It will definitely not be the last visit. So um, I'm here to talk about the, the foundation, um, Sparbank Stiftels and DNB. Um, and I know the reason um, was that um, a couple of years ago, Maria came to Oslo and, and we had this first meeting uh, and she wanted me to come and talk especially about one of the areas we are covering in Norway, uh, Dextra Musica. I will come back to that, but I have to give you a presentation of the foundation because Dextra Musica is just a small part of what we are doing. So it couldn't be better to, uh, to host a place like this because our money comes from the saving bank system. And let me see if I can manage this. Yes, I do. Um, our money comes from the saving bank systems uh, in Norway. Uh, and the first bank was established in 1822. Uh, and here you can see a picture taken, I would guess, 100 years later, maybe 1922. Um, it's more or less the same when you got your first independence. Um, <clears throat> and um, it's all men, you can see here. And it's in front of our uh, head office at that time. And it's also the head office for our foundation today. We are situated there. We have not um, made it onto um, uh, a, uh, a bank um, what we have done here uh, as a museum is a culture house with lots of activities. We have seven, seven scenes um, where you, you can perform, and we have a lot of um, people working there, uh, all within the culture sector. Okay, but um, since the first saving bank was founded in uh, 200 years ago, um, we uh, was the first saving bank uh, foundation set up in 2002. So the bank system in Norway is 200 years this year, and we as a foundation, Saving Bank Foundation, we are 20 years. We own 8.1% uh, of the shares in DNB, and it's the dividend from the bank that um, use, we use to continue philanthropic works. And um, DNB, it's a very big bank. Um, we, uh, we, they, have about 300 billion euros in market value, um, 25 billion euros in equity, and the profit in 2022 is, was about 2.3 billion euros. And the reason for me to point out the profit is that since we own approximately 10%, to, uh, 230 million euros is our money. <coughs> Um, this is probably more familiar to you guys uh, because DNB owns 20% stakes in Luminor. So we, they, I see we, they are um, here in Baltic. Um, and Luminor has approximately 2,300 2, employees. Okay, about the foundation. Um, <coughs> We are mainly supporting projects aimed against children um, <clears throat> and people, uh, young people in their local communities. Since we were founded in 2002, we have spent more than 800 million euros toward charitable causes. We are among the three largest foundations in Norway, a measure by capital, but by far the largest in terms of philanthropic donations. We have two missions. One is to be a long time uh, owner in DNB. Um, we are the second largest owner in DNB, uh, owns about 1.1% of DNB. The uh, far largest is the Norwegian government. They own 33%. So the government and we 
and together has control over the bank, so we will be secure that we will never be part of a European uh, big uh, corporation. We will be owned uh, by Norwegian hands. <coughs> and we use the dividends for philanthropic purposes. Mm -hmm. And that is a long-term tradition that the saving bank systems um, donate a percentage of the profit towards common goods. So we will um, do that also in the future. And um, it's not a point for you, but for us it's um, important that we are giving back money to where the money comes from. And our money comes from the saving bank system in the eastern part of Norway. So my foundation only supports activities taking place in the eastern part of Norway. And the reason for that is that there is over 30 local saving bank foundations around the world, around Norway, who have a lot of money. <clears throat> okay, um, we do projects supporting all kinds of activities, but the main area is within young children up to the age of 25 years. And we support um, mainly <coughs> non-governmental organization. Um, they can apply three times a year. And so the 1st of September this year, I started to read 351 applicants within the culture sector area, because I'm in charge for the culture sector. So I have spent the three last week reading these applicants. Approximately 40% of them are um, yes, and if you are getting a no, you can uh, try again first in December. So if you are within what we are supporting, you will get grants uh, in the end, so don't give up. Um, it, it is the board uh, in the foundation who decides the all allocation of funds but we, in the administration, we give uh, um, recommend, and it, the, the, to be honest, the, the board will always say yes. <clears throat> okay, there is four areas of donation, mm. and uh, I would concentrate on arts and culture since that's what I'm uh, uh, are focusing on, but we are all also supporting um, what we call local communities and cultural heritage, all kind of nature and outdoor life, and sports and play. Back to art and culture, since that's what I'm going to talk about today. <clears throat> we have three areas. We and support um, 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 young people who want to express they serve, they serve at all levels. That would say playing in an orchestra, singing in a choir, giving concerts, we will support it. We support initiatives aimed at attracting new types of audience. And I must say that I attended a concert yesterday with um, the Baltic Phil with Christian um, Nemi. It was absolutely fantastic concerts, and we will definitely have supporting that one. If that has been in Norway, we would have supporting that. Um, and we support um, areas where public meet arts, that will concerts areas, museums, and that kind of stuff. When we set up this foundation in 2002, the government said to us that we could only were allowed, allowed to spend 25% of our net profit every year. But uh, as a charity foundation, that doesn't make sense. We could give away 25%, but 75% of our net profit had to be held back in the foundation. So I wrote a note to the authorities and arguing why couldn't we at least be allowed to invest in something that could come people um, have something to say in the community. And they asked, what, kind, what are you thinking about? And I argued for why couldn't we um, invest in string instruments and in art? And then the, the government said, okay, you can spend at least 
the, up to 25% of your net profit every year in within these two areas. And then we started what I'm going to talk about now and what you will probably be most interesting. Um, we started a, a, to build up a, a, a foundation with um, string instruments and art. So the art is deposited in Norwegian Museum. I'm coming back to that later on. And we invest in valuable string instruments that are lent to leading Norwegian musicians. Um, we also do, uh, uh, as I've uh, told you uh, with the, the first picture, we have done something with the head office. We have made that to the uh, House of Culture. And we also buy some uh, properties that um, would come people in Norway and could have uh, some fun with. So we recently bought a private island in the Oslofjord that was made public, um, available for, for the public. In 2016, we um, purchased our media, Norway largest publisher of local media newspaper, and we established uh, a media foundation as owner of a media group uh, to ensure long-term and stable ownership of Norwegian local news newspapers. But now we are coming to Dexter Musica and why um, I'm invited here today. <clears throat> Um, I would like to go back to 1990 when I was working in DNB. Um, <clears throat> my, if I could felt my dream, I would be a musician. But I was an average musician, and so I decided that it was best to start to work in the bank. So I have a major in economics, and I've studied art history uh, as well. But um, I wanted to be a singer, um, and I sing, uh, sang in the best choir in Norway, and in, my friends were all musicians. So uh, in 1990, they came to me and said, can you help us with instruments? And I went to uh, my boss and said, couldn't we invest in some music instrument? So in 1990, we bought four instruments, and that what I would say was the start for the whole thing. And then, as I told you, in 2002, we set up this foundation, and I knew from the very beginning that this could be a fantastic uh, institution and support for art and culture. So um, I was lucky to be put on the board, um, and we, de we decided soon that we wanted to do something within this field. Uh, I was lucky to... Uh, and start working in this foundation. So I have been a part of it from the very beginning. And then we decided immediately that we should put aside 100 million NOC, that's 10 million euros, and to start to build up Dexter Musica Foundation. So all our instruments are lent to musicians. And we have four, three categories. We have the old masters, that's from 18, the oldest one is from 1585 and up to 1900. And then they are all lent out to professional Norwegian musicians on a long-term contract. And that's different from all other foundation I know, also the Pili Fund. If you are a top musician, you can be sure you can keep the instrument as long as you are uh, active musician on a top level. We want to take it back. So, um, and then uh, what do they pay back? What's their payback? We don't charge them anything. We pay for everything, and uh, in insurance, for maintenance, everything. The payback for us is that they have to uh, volunteer f for five days every year. So, and what they're doing then, we offer these five days to the music uh, um, in Norway. So they are giving master classes, they are conducting amateurs, they have what we call dream concerts. If you are a local uh, amateur um, orchestra, you can apply for a Dexter musician to come and conduct them or to be um, a soloist. 
Um, our aim is to increase interest in classical music and folk music, and, um, and in addition to, uh, to have all these instruments, we uh, spend a lot of money to support orchestras and locals everywhere. We spend tens of millions of euro every year to local music life um, in, in Norway. Okay, the instrument collections. <clears throat> we have about 150 historical and modern instruments. I told you that the old masters, um, between 1585 and 1900, we have about 50 of them. And then we have, what happened now? <laughs> we have about, 10 to 15 instruments, what we call new Italian, and that's, I think, more or less what you are aiming for uh, in the Pilifon, uh, instruments between 1880 up to 1920, 1950. Uh, they are lent to musicians that are finishing school, have finished their school education, and are on a way to establish themselves as musicians uh, and professionals. They are on normally a five-year contract, and then we have 16, 60 instruments, um, modern instruments. They are lent to um, students at the Norwegian Academy of Music and Barat Jue Music Institute. Um, and they can keep them as long as they are students at these institutions. Mm. Here, mm, you can see a Guadagnini cello um, from 1783. This is one of the top instruments um, in our collection. It was uh, owned by Mr. Rostropovich, maybe the most famous uh, celloist from the last century, Russian. Um, and we bought it on an auction um, after he died and, and his family sold it in 10 years ago or something like that. And if I'm lucky, the sound is on. No. Can you put on the sound? The strings are still on. Here's the CPAC. I think it was a one off chance to do this, for it would have been quite complicated to get hold on uh, this cello <laughs> otherwise than through Dexter. And for me it was a, a new experience since um, the last five or six years I was a little bit stuck for myself with the bigger instruments, Stradivari models or my own model. And this is a mind opener, you know, to try to make a, a different uh, architecture and be excited about the outcome too. Should I play very particular with this uh, with this model that is a copy of, of the 1783 Guadagnini owned by Rostropovich and now owned by Dextra Foundation. What is special with this is, um, I mean I'm not an expert in instruments uh, and how it's built and so, but it's, it's really a combination, it's quite, quite short, which makes it uh, easy to play uh, because of the length of the strings and then the for the left hand, but it's extremely wide here. And this distance, as far as my experience goes, uh, uh, decides very much uh, uh, how, the, how the bass and the broadness of the sound.
Tolhef Tedén, who played the cello, is one of the leading celloists in Norden today. And um, Mikael Sturzensocker is uh, one of the leading new um, uh, instrument maker. And we have three or four of his instruments. <laughs> okay, um, I know that most of you pe uh, people present here today are businessmen or women, and that you are interested in, in investing in instruments. Uh, I shall try, and I have looked into to try to find some figures. Um, I will not put my signature of what I'm going to uh, reveal for you now, because we haven't sold any instruments so far. Um, but this is what I've been, uh, I have found. And um, <coughs> the, um, if you are invested in fine instruments, um, you can... Uh, get a, um, a steady annual increase in real returns between 3.7 and 6.9. But um, if you are investing in the top, uh, in the higher level, you can get up to 12% with a little downside of volatility. Violins by Stradivari and Guarneri del Gesù are the most preferred and therefore offer the highest investment opportunity. This is masterpiece effect, um, and I will say something about this a little bit later. Violins that have been played by celebrated musicians uh, attract higher prices, and that's what I've shown you with the Rostov Pro cello. I probably have to pay a little bit more because of that uh, Rostov Pro which I paid, uh, played on it um, earlier. Um, Due to high transaction costs, a violin investor needs to hold on to his or her instrument for more than four years to expect a positive return. The transaction costs associated with buying and selling violins are significantly higher than those on an average trade of financial security. It's much easier to sell a stock and a bond. When you look upon sales, the average holding time for an instrument are 32 years, and a per period which is reduced to 19 years for top tier instruments. And the reason for that, if you buy an instrument, you want to hold on. With a 40 year holding period, the mean uh, yearly return on a top tier while a net of transaction cost is 6.2. After 25 years, 10 years, they annually after cost returns are 5.8 and 3.9. And the reason that if you're going to sell it, um, it's not that easy to sell an instrument. Um, if you go to a retailer, he will normally try to buy your instrument at 50% of what he is going to try to sell it for. But if they were offered the instrument and bought on consignment, they can expect everywhere from 30 to 10 percent of the retail price as commission, depending on the price range and the circumstances of the transaction. The most um, uh, well-renowned and the most famous art dealer is Beers in London, and here you can see actually. Um, how they have discovered and f um, instruments for 20 years to, to see how they have developed. Um, the um, <clears throat> they have collected a number of examples that are representative for typical return. They have used the following criteria. They have only selected sales of violence by well-known makers such as Stradivari and Del Gesso. Um, they have fo followed 20 violins that have been chosen that they were, have a certainty of price both for the initial purchase and the subsequent resale. And in an industry where transactions are generally kept confidential they have picked those examples where the source of information is either bears or public. That means auction houses. 
they try to illustrate the increase in value of each individual instrument. Only examples that have at least five years between sales and resale are illustrated here. And the return is calculated on an annual growth rate basis. And if you can see here, they all, uh, it's a range from 5.5% up to the highest is 17.2%. So on an average, it's 10.6 on an annual growth rate. And that is fantastic uh, figures. Um, these figures are more or less um, conclude with the same, as I told earlier today, that um, instruments climb if you invest in good instruments, you can have a positive average return between, I would say, 5 to 10% annually. <coughs> but how to buy an instrument? You should only buy from a well-known dealer or auction house. And how do we find these instruments? Well, we have picked a top advisor. We, need, we have Peter Bidolf as one of our um, advisors. He is one of the leading experts in this field. And we, when we are, want to invest in a new instrument, we invite um, instrument makers and dealers to come and present this instrument for us. We do this in a trial in um, London. And we will do that in November now. We will buy two new violas. So we have told the instrument world now that we are looking for violas in the range of 500 to 1 million euro. So I would guess there will be between 10 and uh, 20 violas coming. I will bring a viola player. I will bring a pianist. And we have rented um, a church in London, and we will do a trial. And we start with the 20, and then we reduce them until we have picked the right instrument. And um, I will always have a, uh, a second opinion when it comes to, to if the, it is this maker it's supposed to be, and the condition of the instruments. And then it's very important to have a certificate. This is a very important uh, piece of paper. And this one is um, uh, from one of our most prestige um, violins. This is Carlo Bagonsis um, and the, uh, the famous, the Chrysler. Um, Chrysler was one of the most uh, famous um, um, violinist and also a composer from the last century and he played on this um, viola um, violin so it's now called the Chrysler Bagonsi and this is uh, in our uh, it was the very first instrument we bought and one of the finest in our um, collection today this is an, our new national museum in Oslo it opened in June this year, and next year, in February, we will host and, and, and invite you all to come to see our collection in this beautiful new museum. We have called this um, instrument exhibition Meeting the Masters. Um, it's only on for three weeks because these instruments are played on all the time. So it's difficult for us to take them away from the musicians. They will all be there and play on the instruments in the afternoon and give concerts, but they will also be on display. And we will have a seminar the 10th and 11th of February. I hope, Maria, you will be there at least, uh, where we will talk about um, instruments. Um, and 
here you can see last time we did uh, an instrument uh, exhibition. This was in Bergen in 2010. So it will not be um, the same, uh, but it will be something like this. <clears throat> I still have some time, so I will um, tell you a little bit of our um, art collection as well. We buy art um, that uh, we, um, which shows in Norwegian art museums. We only buy um, art to try to com complement the museum's collection. So um, we will buy art that are not um, yet um, in Norwegian art museums. So we are not buying Norwegian art, only um, international art. We have this, and this is our main collection areas. We have a Norwegian artist named Nicola Astrup, who we have present um, abroad now with big success in Sweden, Denmark. Um, he is a Norwegian treasure, um, and we were very proudly uh, to present him in London, in New York, in Germany, with great success. We also, um, uh, are collecting German Expressionism and the reason for that is the most famous Norwegian artist are Edvard Munch and he was very strongly influenced to German Expressionism. They tried to get him um, a part of the most famous German Expressionist um, um, parties as two of them and one was named the Bricke, the other uh, was the Blaue Reiter, and they tried to uh, invite Edvard Munch to be part of their group. He didn't want to do it. But um, in Norwegian museums, there were no German expressionists when we, tried, when we started this journey. So today, um, we have a very nice collection of all the famous German expressionists, like Ernst Ludwig Kirchner, Karl schmidt rotloff Emil Nolde, August Macke, and so on. We also buy Kurt and the avant-garde. Kurt famous German um, artist who lived in Norway in the 30s, um, but there was no art from him when he had to flee from the Nazis. Um, so we have now the, the most prestige Kurschwitter's um, collection outside Germany and we all his friends are also a part of it so that uh, will like René Magritte, my, uh, Mark Ernst, Jean Arp um, are also a part of our collection now. We have a very nice collection of Andy Warhol. We are as everybody else these days concentrating on female pioneers. We have a project with the Monk, new Monk Museum, which we call Monk in Context, where we try to buy artists that has been influenced by Edvard Monk. We have a very nice collection of American street photography. And for you guys, we are also focusing in Nordic art. And we are now very proud that uh, in November this year, we will open an exhibition in Lillehammer Art Museum with Konrad Meggi. Um, and who knows, this might be an artist we can include in our collection in the future. <clears throat> the collection was exhibited exhibit this year at the Munch Museum um, and will soon be shown at the Bergen Art Museum in Bergen. The uh, exhibition was called Playing Pieces um, and was a part of the, our uh, celebration of the 200 years of saving bank tradition. 250,000 people was visiting the exhibition. <coughs> this is probably the highlight in our collection so far. This is one of the most important artworks made in Germany in last century. It's made by um, Hans Ludwig Kirchner at uh, Sogdatenbaden from 1915. And it has a very interesting provenance. 
um, Alfred Fletchmannheim was a, le a leading German dealer, art dealer, and one of the leading in the world in the 20s and the 30s. He um, was Jew, and he has to uh, flee Germany in fear of his life. He fled first to Paris and then to um, London, where he died in 1938. When um, the Germans took over uh, his business, um, the, this painting was sold in 1936 to a German. Um, this German died. He was probably a Nazi, I'm not quite sure, but um, he died in the war. And his widow took this uh, painting to uh, America and sold it in 1949 to... Uh, American uh, collectors. He gave it to the Metropolitan um, Museum in, in New York, and in a bargain uh, in the late 80s between MoMA and Guggenheim, this ended up in the Guggenheim collection. And as you mm, may know, in the, around 2000, um, there was a lot of um, people um, working that all um, owners of Nazi looted art should be given back. So um, the Guggenheim decided um, that they have to give it back to uh, the Jewish community so they had to sell it uh, and the Jewish uh, community wanted to sell it so they sold it in, uh, at auction in Sotheby's in New York uh, in 2018, and we bought it for 20 million um, euros. <clears throat> this is a very famous René Magritte, um, and uh, I wanted to buy this in, 19, in, 20, in 2016, but I was waiting for this one to come. I knew this was coming for sale and I had to keep my money and wait and see how much I did have after buying this one. So I couldn't buy this one, I, but I was offered it for 15 million euro. 15 million euro. It was sold last year for 71 million euros. So, <clears throat> contemporary art performance compares to other major asset class. This one I, is, um, I found uh, in the internet as well by an institution called Masterworks. And they say that contemporary arts outperform other assets. I don't think this is correct. I must warn you immediately. Because they say that um, art, uh, contemporary art give much higher value, as you can see here, um, but this is only contemporary art that are sold twice at auctions. And mm, I would say that it's very, very rare and it's only the only very, very best contemporary artists that are ever sold twice at auctions. If you buy um, contemporary art, from a gallery and bring, take it down the wall, it will be 99.9% .9 you will never get a return on this one. You have to buy, I would say, buy at second hand at auction. I know if the Israeli from the gallery said they will kill me afterwards, but as an investor, that's my recommendation. Be careful because it's very few of the contemporary artists that will manage to go to auction and a second-hand sale. Okay, we, um, most what we do is work through organization and we give grants. We have some, we are only 20 people working in, the organ, in my foundation. But we do some program and I will end one, this presentation, by telling you about one of them that I'm very proud of, and that is what we are called Norwegian Conductors Program. 
um, we tried to mobilize the entire music life from volunteers to musical schools, high schools, universities, amateur orchestra, to all the professional Norwegian symphony orchestra are all part of this journey. We support all kind of um, program from the amateurs to the professionals, from, um, and we are very proud to say that already, we have done this in five or six years, two of the participants in this program has already um, become conductors, uh, associate conductors in Berlin Philharmonic and um, one of the leading uh, Atlanta in US. So this has been very, very um, um, successful. And the reason for me that I wanted to uh, end this presentation with this one is that we have had help from Estonia and one of your very prestigious conductors. So if you can um, help me, I will end my presentation with this video. become a conductor because you want to have a career as a conductor. Career as a conductor happens as a result of you madly being in love and excited and curious about orchestral repertoire. If you are an orchestral musician regardless of the instrument but you go home and you listen to Richard Strauss uh, tone poems or Wagner operas and you say I, I love this stuff this is this is my music then you're one step away from being a conductor actually the number one key is to actually locate the talent Conductors are made and identified by your peers. Even your peers in school intuitively understand and know who has the quality to organize everybody. But uh, people need role models. The problem with female conductors is that there is no lineage of role models. And the role models cannot possibly be the same old men, the physical possibilities are different, the, the way the body works, the way the mind works, everything, everything has to be tailored specially to the specific female being. I am extremely excited about the fact that in Norway there is such a fantastic initiative to develop the young conducting talent and such commitment for 10 years. Talent Norway, I think it's, 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 a, it's an exceptionally good idea. And I am slightly surprised, but very positively surprised, that it comes from Norway. And I hope that a lot of people will follow your footsteps, uh, the footsteps, because I think this is actually the way to do it. Congratulations. Thank you so much for um, <laughs> If you have a question, I will be more than Yes. Please. No, that's, that's why I can't put my mark and say this figures is okay.
because we haven't sold one single instrument uh, or uh, artwork so far. We haven't. Mm. We, 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 could, we could sell, um, and, but so far the musicians have been so happy with these instruments. Um, and as I told you, we, we do a very good research before. We, we try them and we investigate, uh, and we only buy the best. Um, so that's, we haven't sold anything yet. Mm. Yeah, that's not that much actually. Um, we we pay for it, and every instrument has to every year be handed over to an instrument maker to 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 go through and see if there is need in anything. And there is not much, um, not much. Um, of course, there, there there could be the one instrument is from 1585. Um, that's a lot. Um, and th there could be something, um, but no, it's not much. I can't give you any. Uh, I, I pay 150 euros um, to the instrument maker every year um, as an average. Um, 150 euros um, as, as an average, I would say. Um, but yeah, not much. Mm. Um, yeah, you mentioned the briefly, uh, different age or quality segments. Mm. Mm. Could you just briefly repeat because it somehow escaped me? Yes. Do you have the ones and then the newer ones? Yes. And, and how do you differentiate? What, what is your line? Yes. Um, the old masters, I would say, is from 1500 up to 1900. That's that what we call the old masters. Um, and then we have what we call the new Italians. Um, and people are saying now that if you are going to invest and to have what you can expect to have the best uh, return on equity now, you should look into the new Italian. And that's what you are buying from 1880 up to 90, 20, 30. And um, that doesn't cost that much uh, on this, n no. But they are very good instruments, very good instruments. Um, so we have invested uh, and start buying from that period as well. And, and then we have the new instruments made by the, the guy you saw here, Mr. Sturzenhof Ecker. And that's the top. Um, they are cost between 115,000 euro and 20, 25,000 euro. Um, and they are made by the top makers today. But if, if I have been an investor, I think I will uh, listen to the advice and buy, buy the mid-range um, mus music instruments. Now you can have very nice um, instruments between 50,000 euros and up to 150,000 euros, I would say. Very good instruments. Explain a little bit about the selection of musicians. How do you select musicians? Yes, that's very important for us. Uh, I have an advisory board, um, and if I have lived here, I would ask Pavlyavi to be one of uh, the advisors. Um, we, we only I use the best um, professors and musicians in Norway as advisor, um, and we are discussing who are the upcoming who are there already, who need a new instruments. Um, and we are going to buy two new instruments now in November. Um, the musicians are very well known in Norway and they are being picked from um, this advisory board. And now we are trying to find instruments to, to suit them so they can, can lend it. Vi minna kurvan rummet, men samma väl 